the last gearing up for 2024. Again, please. Aww. Thank you. Thank you. And just to let you know, and I don't know what's going on because this is not hay fever season, but yesterday my nose started running and sneezing and watering eyes. And so I've taken several drugs this morning. But uh, just in case I have to sneeze, I will turn off the microphone, grab a Kleenex, and go in the other room. Just been grim. <laughs> so, just for fun, I decided that I would be the presenter for the last presentation of this year. And I have had just a great time putting it together. But I always write out a script. Because if I just did the pictures, I would start going down garden paths and getting off track because something else would come to mind. So I am going to read my presentation. But first of all, I'll introduce today's speaker. <laughs> my name is Janet Magadans. I'm a Benton County Master Gardener. And here I tell you, yes, I will tell you that I have lived in Corvallis since 1964. Yes. I've been in Corvallis longer than a lot of you have been alive. Um, and love the Benton County Master Gardener Association. I've been a Master Gardener since 2012. And it introduced me to people that I just would not have met otherwise. I'm an Oregon State grad, um, I majored in accounting, and I have kiddingly said for many years I was a certified public accountant so that I could afford to be a gardener. I um, have lived in my home on one acre for 51 years this year, and um, I garden intensely, and I do not have deer. I can grow anything. And I have killed just about 30% of whatever I've planted over the years. And I have learned a lot. But what I have learned is that a lot of stuff that we think we know isn't quite true. So I'm going to share with you all kinds of information, and hopefully you you will make some notes. I mean, the handout is really pretty basic. I've just given you lines to make notes. So I will now begin. Isn't that a great picture? Yeah. I have been gardening for a very long time, and when I began, I gleefully purchased every new product that came on the market, purchased nearly every new cultivar that was released and accepted every bit of wisdom that was told to me or I read in a book or magazine. Unfortunately, much of that wisdom had no basis in fact, but we all continue to do these things because they've always been done and the teller of the wisdom will frequently add his or her proof example. As it turned out, much of this wisdom is, in fact, a myth. On one online definition of myth is a widely held but false belief or idea. There are all kinds of myths floating around the universe, and I'll share a few of a non-garden-related myth. Bulls get angry when they see red. According to Temple Grandin, hopefully most of you know the very famous Temple Grandin, cattle lack the red retina receptor and can see only yellow, green, blue, and violet colors. Here. I think maybe I pushed the wrong button. There we go. If you go outside with wet hair, you will get sick. 
According to the Mayo Clinic, colds are caused by viruses, so you can't catch a cold going outside with wet hair. Twinkies have no expiration date. <laughs> <laughs> Teresa Cogswell, former vice president of research and development at Interstate Bakeries Corporation, told the Washington Post that the snack has a shelf life of 25 days. So there. I hope I haven't shocked your long time held wacky beliefs with these three examples. But what I want you to know, there are some wacky beliefs in the gardening world, and I'm going to talk to you about several of them today, not just to entertain you, but to raise your awareness that you need to be cautious when you're hearing or reading garden-related information. The other thing I want you to keep in mind during my presentation, you may very well have done one or more of these myths and nothing bad happened. In fact, you may have been successful. Me too. For example, I have frequently read that when you plant a shrub, dig a hole two and a half times the width of the shrub's root ball. I have never done that. And I never will. When I get home with a new shrub or conifer, I'm in such a big hurry to get it in the ground that I dig a hole just big enough for the root ball, and in it goes. Then I stand back and either marvel at its beauty, or pull it out and plant it somewhere else. <laughs> However, you also need to know that I have very good soil, and I'm irrigating all the time, and maybe I'm just lucky. Regardless of what kind of gardener you are, you may be a pretty garden person, with lots of flowers and bulbs, or you're an advocate of wood, woodland gardens where you can meander among the trees, or you're a vegetable gardener. I know you all want to do what is right, so let's begin. The primary source of material for this presentation is from publications from Professor Linda Chalker Scott. Linda is a professor in the Department of Horticulture at Washington State University. She has a PhD in horticulture from Oregon State with additional distinguished certifications. I'm telling you this to alert you to the fact that Chalker Scott knows of what she writes and has done extensive research on the topics I'll be discussing. In fact, in her two books, she includes several supporting citations of research from others. I will be quoting her frequently through my presentation, so I won't always be indicating direct quotations. Number one, I want to begin this presentation with a serious subject. Who do you believe? Chalker Scott entitled this subject, The Myth of Absolute Science. The example she included was a book entitled, The Sound of Music and Plants. I heard about this on national television, like CBS, ABC, National News, when the book first came out. A book scientifically proved, in quotation marks, that classical music benefits plant growth, while acid rock music has a negative effect. <laughs> now, I know that this statement is absolutely true for me, but apparently the author of this publication uh, is attributing human emotions to plants. Chalker Scott listed several deficiencies in the research but interesting to me is the fact that the book was published by a company that specializes in New Age literature. This is off of, of my computer. I just took a screenshot. I googled videos showing plants love classical music. So there are two YouTube links 
classical music to help plants grow dash Beethoven. Music for plant growth, classical music for healthy plants. And then down under people also ask, what is the best classical music for plants? Do plants prefer to listen to classical music? What music is good for plant lovers? <laughs> what music do plants like most? So it's online, so it's got to be true. <laughs> Keep in mind who the publisher was. The author anthropomorphizes, in other words, she compares plants to humans in terms of likes and dislikes, their feelings and idiosyncrasies. This is poor reasoning and biases her expectations. If you remember nothing else from my presentation, please remember to be very careful when you're researching and check more than one website to ensure there's consensus with appropriate citations. The bottom line, Science does not prove a hypothesis. It either disproves or supports a set of assumptions. This is why science is constantly changing as old hypotheses are discarded or amended as we learn more about the natural world. I live with this next myth entitled the myth of plastic sheeting to prevent weeds. <laughs> I think this myth began in the 1970s because we moved into my existing home in 1972 and my mother was off and running laying black plastic in several places on our property. Now this isn't landscape fabric that is woven and designed to allow moisture to move through it. We're talking regular old black plastic that comes in big rolls. My driveway is about 100 feet long, and there are planting beds on both sides. My mother did an enormous amount of work rolling out, cutting, laying it out on the ground, and then covering it with bark mulch. When I began gardening, my focus was on the backyard, so I didn't realize what she had done. But after I was, I realized I was running out of plant areas in the backyard, I decided to begin planting lovely shrubs and trees along the driveway. And by that time, there were several layers of mulch that had been laid over the years. So as I stuck my shovel into the ground, it would slide in easily and then hit the plastic. I'm not going to tell you about the frustration of cutting the plastic out, trying to get the plastic under heavy layers of accumulated mulch but the bottom line is, how many weeds have I pulled along the driveway during those 50 years? And you know, just think about the logic. Where do seeds come from, weed seeds? Yeah. The wind blows. They're not necessarily coming from underground. But I know that my mother read something and she just thought, that's going to cut down on my work. Not my work. <laughs> Moving on to one of my favorites is what Chopper Scott calls the myth of drainage material in containers. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but how many of you have put rocks, gravel, or packing peanuts in the bottom of larger garden pots so you don't have to use... Thank you for volunteering. <laughs> So you don't have to use so much expensive potting soil or to reduce the weight of the pot once planted and assuming it will increase drainage. The logic of doing this is that there are larger sized items, gravel or rocks in the bottom, so surely the water will drain through more quickly. We want this to occur so that the roots of the plant don't get waterlogged and begin rotting. According to Chopper Scott, nearly 100 years ago, soil scientists demonstrated that water does not move easily from layers of finely textured material to layers of more coarsely textured material. This statement means that for nearly 100 years we've been doing it wrong. And these are pictures of supposed drainage material when I googled the subject. 
I am now going to play a short YouTube video, hopefully, that demonstrates this. I was going to try this out before we started, and then I forgot, so let's hope this will work. Oh, shoot. I've got to log. People, you're just going to have to wait a minute. I forgot to log in to the Wi-Fi. Now, see, if I had done what I said I was going to do and try that out before the presentation, I would have the Wi-Fi all <coughs> turned on. I do always have to disconnect. And then I have to do this one, disconnect. And then it takes a bit of time. Ooh, wait, pretty good. All of us who were gardeners when we were younger may have gardened with our grandmothers who always told us to put rocks or clay pot shards in the bottom of the pot to improve drainage. But research has actually shown that if you have a, a shallow a container or a shallow it. soil profile, you actually get less, sorry, drainage. We have three different types of pots. The bulb pot, the azalea pot, and then the standard pot. These three sponges are all filled with water to the same amount. If we leave this one shallow, like this narrower pot, um, it'll hold all of the water in it. But if I tip this sponge on its side to mimic the profile of the azalea pot, you begin to get drainage because the capillaries are longer and gravitational pull will actually be greater on it so it will drain more water out by having a longer soil profile. And if we tip the sponge on its side, the long way to mimic the standard pot, which has a longer soil profile, there's more gravitational pull on that water in this sponge. And again, you will begin to see more water drain out of this soil profile. So if we leave gravel out of the pots, we actually have a longer soil profile, which allows gravitational pull to work on the water in the soil and you actually get better drainage by filling the pot entirely with soil rather than having something in the bottom of the pot. This is Donna Hoffman for the University of Wyoming Extension, and you're watching From the Ground Up. How about that? You know, it just made sense when she was talking about it. Okay, so let's get back to what we were. Oh yeah, last thought about this subject. It is perfectly fine to place a couple of broken pieces of pottery over the drainage hole. The main purpose for doing this is to help prevent potting soil from draining out of the bottom of the pot. On to the myth of winter watering. Many of us have been told to encourage assisted dormancy by either reducing or eliminating water, watering beginning in the fall. I guess the logic is that the shrubs and trees aren't smart enough to plan for dormancy, and it's our job to ensure our plants survive the winter months. In reality, our shrubs and trees are as smart as we are, because just like us, as the daylight gets shorter and the nights begin to get colder, the plant material is internally beginning the dormancy process, and you can screw it up by discontinuing water. Quoting, the lack of water induces a drought stress on these plants, inhibiting their ability to undergo the biochemical and physiological changes needed to obtain maximal cold hardiness. Furthermore, the early leaf senescence, or leaf dying, induced by the lack of water, means the plant has fewer stored resources to put into next year's growth. The overall result will be a stunted, stress-sensitive plant. So when do you stop watering then? You don't. So it's pouring rain. Yeah, it's going to rain all. 
and, and the plant is is shutting itself down naturally. So don't try to help it along. Just let it do it naturally. Some people quit watering like in October or something. It's not good for the plant. Next, the myth of extraordinary Epsom salt. Some of the claims for using Epsom salts are, number one, using it as a fertilizer may, underline, may, improve flower blooming and enhance plants' green color. I chuckle as I read, may improve. This is the equivalent of me getting emails from various companies advertising the sales that indicate up to 50% off. Number two, some gardeners claim using Epsom salts can prevent blossom end rot in tomatoes. According to information from the University of Minnesota Extension website, blossom end rot is caused by a calcium deficiency and adding Epsom salt to the soil can actually prevent adequate calcium from getting into your plants making blossom end rot even worse. Number three, Epsom salt enhances seed germination and growth. Epsom, number four, Epsom salt makes plants grow bushier. Number five, according to the Epsom, Epsom Salt Council, master gardeners recommend its use although there was no information about when it was recommended, nor which Master Gardener Association made this recommendation. And who knew there was an Epsom Salt Council? <laughs> and last, Epsom salts deter, deter pests, including slugs and voles. This claim has been studied since 1915 without success. Epsom salt is magnesium sulfate. Magnesium is needed by plants to generate the chlorophyll needed for photosynthesis. So adding Epsom salt makes sense. Let's help Mother Nature grow big, green, healthy leaves and plants. According to Chalker Scott, among the diverse plant materials that have been studied under treatment with Epsom salt, there are two commonalities. All are intensely produced crops, and all were suffering from magnesium deficiency. In other words, the research that can generate extraordinary claims for Epsom salts were done on intensive commercial crops, and the soil had been tested and magne magnesium deficiency was discovered. Your bottom line on the myth is, if you think your soil has magnesium deficiency, get your soil tested. Jeff Cope spoke last week, and I told him that I was going to do this presentation, and he immediately said, well, what about eggshells? And I said, oh, great idea. You, you probably, everyone in this room has heard about the benefits of crushed eggshells, keeping out the slugs. I hope so. <laughs> this is sort of a charming idea. Save your eggshells after peeling the eggs, crush them up, and spread them around your little vegetable seedlings in the spring, and those darn slugs can't get at them because the sharp edges of the eggshells will lacerate the slug's soft belly, resulting in dead slug bodies available for their carnivorous slug neighbors. You know that many slugs are carnivorous. Finding supporting information for this is really, these, this is off of a website. The internet is full of postings singing the praises of crushed eggshells, preventing slugs from eating our plants. However, none of the websites I checked came from a university or website such as extension.oregonstate.edu. These pictures came from a website entitled allaboutslugs.com, and I found several 
references indicating that slugs are actually attracted to the eggshells <laughs> because there are some of that interior membrane of the shells that, that is left. You see that I circled. And so, you know, here he is crawling up to get at that. And then, of course, this one. But you look at decimated. How could that happen with those eggshells there? <laughs> The myth of hot weather watering. According to Chalker Scott, the claim is that water drops accumulating on leaf surfaces act as tiny magnifying glasses, focusing the sun's en energy into intense beams that burn the leaf. I did a fair amount of research online trying to find websites that still recommend this restriction, but pretty much came up without, which is good news. To complete the thought about watering, quoting, <clears throat> if your plants are showing signs of water stress in the middle of the day, by all means, you should water them. Postponing irrigation until the evening, not a good time to water anyway, as this can encourage fungal pathogens, or the following morning <coughs> could damage your plants and expose them to opportunistic diseases. However, one important consideration is not to be running irrigation during the hot weather because of increased evaporation. I know you're all sitting there mentally <coughs> affirming this recommendation. However, I frequently drive through Corvallis during very warm days and encounter sprinkling systems sprinkling away during the middle of the day. If for no other reason, try to reduce your water bills. The myth of tree staking. <clears throat> this subject really isn't a myth, but I've included it because I think there are misconceptions on when and how trees should be staked. That being said, I'm going to include the bottom line information from Chopper Scott. Number one, most trees contained, bald and burlapped, do not need staking. Bare root trees often do. Number two, if trees must be staked, place stakes as low as possible, but no higher than two-thirds the height of the tree. You'll notice where these stakes are. They're lower down on the <coughs> trunks of the trees. Materials used to tie the tree to the stake should be flexible and allow for movement all the way down to the ground so the trunk taper develops correctly. And number four, remove all staking materials after roots have established. This can be as early as a few months, but should be no longer than one growing season. I have seen stake trees where the stakes have been there for several years. I think people just get to the point where they kind of don't see them, and perhaps underestimate how quickly roots grow in Oregon. This is another good one. The myth of paper-based sheet mulch. The idea of using newspapers or cardboard as a mulch is an attractive idea because we all have newspapers and cardboard, and we know it will be easy to install and it will help prevent weed growth. However, there are recommendations for proper use. Here's what you need to know and consider. Termites prefer cardboard over wood chips, chips as a wood source. <laughs> Number two, voles frequently nest underneath mulch sheets. Number three, newspaper and cardboard sheet mulches become hydrophobic, which means to repel, if allowed to dry out, causing rainfall or irrigation water to sheet away rather than percolate through. This is particularly true in regions with droughty summers, Oregon, Willamette Valley, or well-drained soils. If you're considering using cardboard, consider that it may be coated to improve smoothness, smoothness, and it certainly has adhesive gluing the sides of the fluting inside the material.
The myth of wound dressing. This may be another one of the myths that has lost its attractiveness, but a quick search on the internet found these products readily available at Home Depot, Amazon, and A.M. Leonard. The tree coat product indicates it is a special process black asphalt emulsion. Black asphalt is made from crude petroleum, and tree coat wants us to spread that on an open wound of a living, precious tree. Just to make you feel even worse for that poor tree, wound dressings prevent the tree's own defense mechanisms from operating well since oxygen is required for the chemical reactions that form wound wood, to choke, quote Chalker Scott. And the myth of fragile roots. I think Google knows that I'm a master gardener because when I Googled this subject, I couldn't find anything. But there are still websites that do tell you to treat the plants as if the roots are delicate and in danger of shriveling in front of your eyes. According to Chucker Scott, woody perennials, shrubs, and trees all benefit from a more vigorous approach. Pot-bound plants develop circling root systems when roots encounter the edge of the container and continue to grow al along this surface. Of course, this advice isn't appropriate when transplanting seedlings, but those roots are pretty tender. I have many containers for sempervivums or hens and chicks, and when I buy them in four-inch pots, the plants are too deep to fit in my container, so I knock off the soil both around and under the plant before placing it in a container. I also pull the plants apart so that I can plant them separately, and it doesn't phase them. You all may have bought a plant on sale a time or two at the end of the season and pulled it out of the pot and just a mass, mass of roots. The best thing you can do is start with a sharp, at least cutting those roots so that you're breaking them apart. Otherwise, they could just continue to grow around and around. The myth of tree topping. This is really tough because as they were doing that major work on Highway 20 going towards Albany. Trees on the left side as you were traveling north, they came through and just scalped them off. You all should know that you never pop a tree. I'm seeing trees that have either been planted under power lines or grew so large over time that they have grown into power lines and the poor trees have just been butchered. That's a different topic from, than tree topping, but I'm still <coughs> seeing people plant trees under power lines, so please keep that in mind. Back to tree topping, quoting, a reduction cut, also called thinning to a lateral, a, a limb that is not growing up but is growing out this way, is a method of pruning yet used to reduce the height of a tree. When done properly, branches are cut back to a lateral branch, at least one-third the diameter of the limb being removed. The lateral branch becomes the source of new terminal growth, and subsequently the tree maintains a natural form. I've included two sets of pictures just to give you an idea of what needs to be considered and you can see they have numbered A, B, and C as competing leaders. And they have cut them out so that this becomes the new dominant leader. And then the next one, I thought this was a really good picture because they're showing all of the cuttings that they took out um, to keep them from rubbing across each other and you just have a much healthier and more attractive tree. Too often I see people planting trees and then never touching it again. And they just grow into these massive trees with branches going every which way. And 
trees need to be maintained just like every other plant we put in our yard. The myth of foliar feeding. Some of the supposed benefits of spraying your fertilizer on the leaves of your plants are number one, prolonged bloom, number two, increased crop yields and storage life, number three, maximize plant health and quality, number four, boosting growth during dry spells, number five, increasing cold and heat tolerance, number six, pest and disease resistance, and number seven, any time of stress. And number eight, helping the internal circulation of the plant. Quoting, <laughs> generally the results suggest that foliar application of particular nutrients can be used in crop production when soil conditions limit nutrient availability. For instance, alkaline soils do not readily release many metallic nutrients. Iron and manganese are especially difficult for plants to take up under alkaline condition. Foliar feeding is yet another agricultural practice best suited to intensive crop production under specific soil limitations. The myth of uniform plant performance on nursery tags the tags will give you an accurate indication of final plant size. These two pictures are the best I could come up with. This topic immediately made, made me remember purchasing a David Austin rose named after the famous British horticulturalist Graham Thomas. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous rose. At the time, I had purchased several rose books because I had pulled out or dug up all my hybrid tea roses since I was tired of dealing with the rust, black spot, and powdery mildew. Yeah. At the time, I read that this rose would grow to about four to five feet tall, and it was very resistant to the problems with hybrid teas. Well, it's true, it was disease resistant, but it grows about 12 feet tall. <laughs> I had to move it, and it now climbs up next to my fence where I can tie it up to keep it from sprawling. My point being, don't believe everything you read on plant labels or in garden publications. To finish my story, the rose book I relied on was published in Canada, where their winters are much colder and much longer than ours, and their climate can be significantly different than the Willamette Valley. Last thought about nursery tanks. When it indicates the plant will grow to five feet tall, that means in 10 years, your plant will probably grow to five feet tall. So after your 10, does your plant quit growing? <laughs> Pay attention to the labels, but keep in mind really what it's saying. The myth of gypsum magic. Adding gypsum to your yard or garden will improve soil tilth and plant health. I found several sites online that recommended this treatment from Pennington.com, and it's a company um, that sells a lot of garden related material. <coughs> Quoting. Improving soil structure and relieving compaction aren't the only ways that gypsum benefits your lawn and garden. Gypsum adds calcium and sulfur, essential plant nutrients, to your soil. While lime adds calcium and makes soil less acidic, gypsum adds calcium without affecting your soil pH. Adding gypsum to vegetable gardens help prevents calcium deficiency a primary cause of blossom and rot disease. There's that blossom and rot disease again. This common disease can undermine your harvest of garden favorites such as tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, and melons. 
Adding gypsum at planting type time keeps calcium plentiful, so fruit can ripen without end rot. The calcium in gypsum helps your strawberry patch reach its juicy potential, too. Close quotes. The bottom line. Gypsum can improve heavy clay soil structure and remove sodium from saline soils. Gypsum has no effect on the fertility, structure, or pH of any other soil type, and most important, before adding gypsum or any chemical to a landscape, have a soil analysis performed to identify mineral deficiencies, toxicities, and soil character, close quotes. At no point did the Pennington website recommend having a soil analysis. The myth of milk and roses, this one I had never heard of. Found lots of information online. It was very easy to find several websites promoting this. <clears throat> from a website entitled agardenforthehouse.com, quoting, according to author and horticultural professor Jeff Gilman, who has conducted extensive research on black spot remedies, a spray composed of one part milk and two parts water is the <coughs> best answer to the disease. When applied weekly, this solution controls black spot as well as any synthetic fungicide, including chlorotelanil. Why does milk work against black spot? Well, nobody knows for sure. Gilman thinks, underlined, this was on the website, Gilman thinks it is the lactoferrin that milk contains. Lactoferrin, as a matter of fact, helps to fight diseases in people. There is information that milk has been used in reducing the transmission of leaf viruses such as tobacco mosaic, and milk is routinely recommended as an organic hand sanitizer. Have you ever heard of that? <laughs> uh, when handling virus susceptible seedlings for transplant, in general, it appears that milk applied before fungal inoculation is more effective than milk applied after infection. The bottom line, there is no evidence that milk sprays are effective in controlling black spot on roses or any other ornamental plant species. The myth of weed killing gluten. How many of you remember when this became popular? I fell for this one several years ago. Back in the 90, 1990s, I read about this terrific organic herbicide, and all I needed to know was that the research was done at a university, so I bought a bag. This was before research information was easily found online, so whenever I read about this gluten product, product I took at face value. Quoting, corn gluten is a high nitrogen, 10%, natural compound with documented success in reducing seed germination of many species. A pre-emergent herbicide, corn gluten meal, inhibits root development during seed germination, at least partially by desiccating the soil and reducing water uptake. Close quotes. The rest of the story from the Iowa State researchers <clears throat> is that they are careful to point out that corn gluten meal does not affect existing weeds and that the nitrogen in the meal will benefit existing weeds as well as the desirable plants. Duh! 10% nitrogen, you know? The other thing to keep in mind is that the research was done in Iowa, whose climate is significantly different than the Willamette Valley. One more example to keep in mind when reading information online. Okay. Another drink. <laughs> We're going to finish up with garden myths that are typically found online as old wives' tales. 
We're not going to address the why of it being wives that have the old garden tales. <laughs> but I suspect it's similar to sewing, quilting, and knitting, knitting as being a craft instead of an artistic endeavor. Okay. Get off my high horse because I sew, quilt, and knit. Okay. Give your scarecrow your favorite hat if you want a good harvest. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. banana peels in your garden because they contain <clears throat> potassium. Plant potatoes on Good Friday. <laughs> How many of you knew about planting potatoes according to the, the moon? As a child, um, I was born in North Dakota, and my next door neighbors um, had great big vegetable garden, and they grew a lot of potatoes. They used to pay me a nickel when I was a child to help them plant potatoes at night. I can remember doing that. Those farmers. Pennies in a water-filled bag will repel flies. I didn't have to make anything up. <laughs> Adding sugar to the soil will make your tomatoes taste sweeter. <laughs> cute? Black tea keeps your maiden hair fern happy. <laughs> and the last one, Janet, won't be able to garden forever, and I won't be chair of the gearing up committee forever, so this is my last time standing up here, opening up the gearing up for gardening meeting. I've not kept track, but I've chaired this committee many years, and you all keep graciously coming back year after year. I consider Gearing Up for Gardening the premier educational event that BCMGA provides because there is no charge for this event and the Corvallis Benton County Library provides this warm, large room without charge and you get to learn all kinds of gardening information from well-experienced gardeners. Thank you for your attendance. Go garden.